Do I see the genocide is ongoing today? Yes, it's just the weapons are different. I'm Kiara. I'm a Karankwa Kadla woman from the Hawk clan. I live in Austin, Texas now, but my ancestors are from here. These lands we now call Corpus Christi. I'm very lucky. I was raised knowing that I was indigenous to these lands we now call Texas. It was made to be like a very huge big deal that the lands we now call Texas were our home, had always been our home. We visited Corpus as often as we could. And as I grew older, we started to establish a larger community amongst us, Karankwa Kadla. As I started reconnecting with my Karankwa brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and everybody, we came together very formally to try to stop and bridge that fossil fuel distribution facility that's trying to tear up some land that's real important and sacred to us. My name is Lev Sanchez. I'm a co-founding member of the indigenous peoples of the Coastal Bend, and I'm also a tribal member of the Kuronkwe Kala tribe. I am half Lipan Apache on my mom's side, and then Kuronkwe on my great-great-grandma's side, which they're from Goliad, and they were here also in Corpus. So, and then the Lipan Apache side of myself was here in Corpus. I was born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. I've been here 40 years. <laughs> I'm rooted. <laughs> My name is Dorothy Pena. I'm from Corpus Christi. I was born here. I grew up here. My mother's family's from Germany. My father's family's from Mexico. Um, and I just love this place. <laughs> How am I doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing okay. Yeah. How are you doing? Glad to be here. At this point, I should also introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ethan Perryman, and I'm an independent filmmaker who shot and edited the majority of this project. I'm also a white man, and that affects the way that I look at the world. So I invite you, as you watch, to consider the ways in which my identity impacted the questions that I asked and the editorial decisions that I made, as well as how your identity impacts the way you receive the film as a viewer. What would you want a documentary like this to focus on? It would be easiest and simplest for it to be about the negative impacts that the fossil fuel industry is putting upon the earth, but I think at the core of that, it's having people reconnect to their own ancestors and their own connection to the Mother Earth. I think that what is central is that you have frontline communities and people of color fighting injustices in our society and they have been the people that have made things change and shift <laughs> you can come by <laughs> I would like it to focus on the systemic racism that occurs in this community but if it's like focusing on that it would be something that every community has experienced because this country is founded on on violence and discrimination against people and and I have traveled a lot so I get to see that in every place I go there is an environmental issue there is a a social human issue and so if we can focus on how everyone is experiencing that then everyone can feel connected to something to fight for. Could you tell me a little bit more about like the site of the proposed construction? Yeah, McGloin's Bluff. McGloin's Bluff is a Corpus Christi Ingleside area and it is basically if you were looking at it from the waters and you see the shore it is the only piece of land that doesn't already have lots of different oil infrastructure. And it is also the Karankwa settlement. So what that means is my ancestors, that's where they would camp. From roughly the 1300s to the 1700s, Karankwa people inhabited a settlement at the site now known as McGloin's Bluff. 
Due to its connection to their ancestors, members of the present-day Karankawa Kadla hold the site sacred, and despite being violently displaced from the area, continued to visit the site until quite recently. It's directly next to the oil distribution facility now owned by Enbridge, previously owned by Moda. It used to be accessible from the land, but now that Enbridge has taken it over, it's only accessible from the water. So we've basically already lost access. Have you been to that site personally? I've been unable. Okay. Yeah. Do you know people who have been? Yeah. So the hot clan, they used to go there, our medicine man leading them specifically, a lot for prayer and ceremony. I do know that some members of the, um, the Coyote and the hot clan, my clan, would go there. I just hadn't ever had the opportunity, but um, it used to be used. It is truly the last physical piece of our history that in my own verbiage proves that we were here which to me is so important because it says in textbooks that we're extinct so if we could have like those tangible pieces in our still living hands we need access to that land and I haven't ever been on that land I haven't had my feet touch the soil and that's so upsetting I feel like I deserve it since 1957, archaeologists have recovered around 40,000 artifacts from the settlement at McGloin's Bluff. Things like pottery, uh, tools, arrowheads, just they used to live there, so there's lost remains. In 2006, the site was approved as a Texas State Archaeological Landmark and added to the National Registry of Historic Places. So the settlement in Ingleside, that's special because that was a gathering of places where other tribes would come and gather with us. There was marriages there, there were ceremonies, there was burials, obviously, because three miles from that area there was remains found. So we're just trying to preserve that. And so in between all these permitting processes that the fossil fuel industry are trying to obtain, it so happens that our, our family's right there in that area. So before that even happened, we were already were fighting expansion. In 2008, the McGloin's Bluff site was purchased from the Corpus Christi Port Authority by Occidental Petroleum. In 2018, it was subsequently sold to Moda Midstream. In 2019, Moda Midstream announced that it would be expanding its neighboring Ingleside Energy Center onto the eastern portion of the Karankawa settlement. The Ingleside Energy Center is North America's largest crude oil export terminal, currently exporting around 925,000 barrels of crude oil per day. That's roughly a quarter of U.S. crude oil exports. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers granted Moda a permit for the expansion, which would essentially double its vessel capacity. On August 3, 2021, indigenous peoples of the Coastal Bend, the Karankawa Kadla tribe, and the Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association entered into a lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers for approving the permit. The lawsuit alleges that the Corps of Engineers violated the National Environmental Policy Act and the Clean Water Act by failing to investigate impacts, alternatives, and mitigation measures of the terminal expansion. I hope we win this lawsuit. I don't like to really talk about the end result, but we're doing really good right now, so I'm proud of us. This is not a case of the Corps of Engineers failing to dot their I's and cross their T's. This is a case of them failing to do the most basic due diligence on an expansion representing roughly a quarter of the U.S.'s entire crude oil export capabilities. In other words, they completely failed their duty. In September 2021, a company called Enbridge acquired Moda Midstream for $3 billion. Through this deal, they also acquired control of Moda's expansion permits. So, when Enbridge got a chance to profit off the destruction of native land and culture, I jumped at the chance because acts of kindness make us a real part of the community. Enbridge plans to continue the expansion started by Moda, but construction has been pushed back due to the lawsuit, which is currently ongoing. But who is Enbridge? Enbridge is a Canadian oil and natural gas pipeline company operating the longest pipeline system in North America. Enbridge has been responsible for at least a thousand oil spills for a total of over nine million gallons leaked. This includes the largest inland oil spill in U.S. history, the 1991 Line 3 oil spill, in which 1.7 million gallons of oil were spilled into wetlands in Minnesota. Over its long history of willful environmental degradation, 
Enbridge has repeatedly targeted indigenous communities. It was one of the companies responsible for the Dakota Access Pipeline, which started construction in North Dakota in 2016 in violation of treaties with the Standing Rock Sioux. When thousands arrived at Standing Rock to protest, police and private security forces brutalized protesters with attack dogs, tear gas, and water cannons in freezing weather. Similarly, the ongoing expansion and rerouting of Enbridge's Line 3 through indigenous lands in Minnesota has drawn thousands of protesters. In a 2022 letter to shareholders, Enbridge cited the Ingleside Energy Center specifically as key to future profitability. There's tons of oil refineries all across these lands we now call Corpus Christi. Enbridge is trying to expand and just take over the fossil fuel industry. All of this fight is a cumulative effort against the fossil fuel industry as well as preserving indigenous culture and history. For me personally though, it's also a matter of land back, returning all land to indigenous peoples so that we could kind of undo the damage that's been done by the fossil fuel industry. I see the people coming in that are not from here, they don't know what's happening, with smiles, enjoying the water. Um, this area just is peaceful. I mean, even though there's so much destruction and expansion happening, um, it's a beautiful place and that's why we're protecting it. As per latest updates, construction on the expansion has been pushed back to November 8th, 2022. How do you feel about the existence of the U.S. like as a state? Do you think that it's legitimate? Do you think it deserves to be here? Or the United States like as... Like as a country? Oh, God. Yeah, no, they're not, it's not good how it was established. Uh, all the land was taken from everybody and the manifest destiny was not good, obviously. Mass genocide. I think that if a country is founded off of genocide and slavery, they need to be tried. I think there have been lots and lots and lots of crimes that have gone unatoned for. I try to do my best to not even align myself with any political system. I try not to align myself with the beliefs and ideologies of the country. Rather, I focus on the land and the importance of the land and the sacredness of the land. I don't know what this country values, but I didn't learn whatever values I carry within myself from looking at society. I had to learn that what was important to me through my family, through my community, through through my culture. It wasn't from this country that I learned values of caring and understanding. I feel like their motives are money and they don't think about the pollution and destruction that they're doing to the land and water. The same Supreme Court that ruled horribly on Roe versus Wade changed the EPA guidelines and, t and now is telling EPA, we're taking away your power to try to stop or help communities just it goes full circle all they care about is power and money and then they don't care about this destruction of the land and water for nothing it's all about profit I don't know much about the legal system but uh, I don't trust it especially with the most recent Roe versus Wade uh, happenings I also think it is a very intentionally built system designed to suppress oppress brown people, that's not just indigenous people, that's black people, that's people that they now call immigrants or migrants. So yeah, the odds are forever stacked against people who are brown. How do you see the proposed Enbridge expansion as being connected to that? Systemic racism? Well, it particularly targets the Karankawa community. Um, but besides that, Obviously, Enbridge is really encroaching on a sacred space for the Kronkwa people. But it's not just that industry. It's the proposed desal plants that are going to be in the backyard of our African-American community at Hillcrest that have been subjugated to racial discrimination since the 30s or 40s um, and continue to be discriminated against. It's watching our environment be degraded. Like you can simply just go out on the shore right now and see the expansion of our ship channel and what that will do to the bay. We are the ones, this community that is predominantly of color, are the ones that are paying the price. 
To gain some historical background, I spoke with Tim Sider, a historian who's friends with Love and other members of the Karankawa Kamba. My name is Tim Sider. I'm a PhD candidate at Southern Methodist University, and I'm writing my dissertation on the Karankawa peoples. It's a general history of the Karankawa peoples from around 1250 BP, or before present, to the present day. I grew up along the Gulf Coast. I grew up on Karankawa land, hence my interest in these people. Whenever we say the Karankwas, we are speaking in an umbrella term. And Karankwa means people that spoke the same language and shared a similar culture. They spoke Karankwan, which is a language, and they all had a very similar culture. But there were different Karankwa tribes. There were five major tribes, and these tribes lived all the way up around the Galveston area at certain points down to Corpus Christi. The Kronk was one, seasonally migrated, but they did have permanent settlements. Two, they were powerful, they controlled the Gulf Coast for longer than the United States has been a nation. And three, the Kronkwa culture is comprised of many different tribal groups. They're not just one single Kronkwa entity. They did become more consolidated during the 1780s, 1770s, but that was only to ward off genocide against their people. Stephen F. Austin, who many consider to be the father of Texas, believes the only way to subdue and get rid of the Karankwas is through extermination. And then the narrative is that the Karankwas go extinct in the 1850s, 1860s, that the Anglo-Americans run them out of the territory and we no longer have any information about the Karankwa people. But in reality, these Karankwas are able to integrate themselves into Anglo-American society and to other native groups and also into Mexican society. And when they integrate themselves into these groups, even though being an Indian is looked down upon and they try to hide this Indianness because of necessity, they still retain and maintain their cultural aspects and they pass it down generation after generation. And recently, really in the early 2000s, you have a large group of people who are coming forward and saying, hey, I have Karankwa blood, I have Karankwa ancestry. And they're stepping forward and they're reclaiming their past. And from them, through oral histories, we're able to piece together this gap in history where the Karankwas were once extinct. What people fail to understand about colonization is that it's still happening. They also fail to understand that they have been, I believe, intentionally taught otherwise by our education system. Good education is coming from an unbiased source. That's factual. The history that's taught now is not coming from an unbiased source. It's coming from white settlers that hated the indigenous people and wanted us gone. The start of the Karankwa's history has already started in bias. And so when you have Anglo-Americans coming in in the 1820s, they already see these people living on the Gulf Coast as savages because the Spaniards are depicting them that way. You have professional historians coming in and they're looking at the Karankwa's past and all they see are biased accounts of these people. They see accounts by Anglo-Americans who sought out to annihilate the Karankwas, and they see accounts by Spanish priests and Spaniards who upset the Karankwas for not being good Christians. And so using this source base of biased accounts, they create a picture of the Karankwas that has spread this notion that the Karankwas were seven feet tall, that they were extremely cannibalistic. If you grew up in Texas, and you took Texas history, you learn about these native peoples in a very inaccurate way. You learn that they are these savages. But in actuality, the opposite is the case. When the Anglo-Americans committed genocide against the Karankwas, it was very convenient for them to label these people as totally extinct. Because if you label a Native American group as extinct, they can't come back and reclaim their land. Land back for the Kronk was, I believe, is, is very much a great policy. 
And I think that it's, you know, I know that it's already occurring right now. And you have certain individuals who have, or are planning to pass on their private land to the Karankwa Kala. Because the Karankwas were forced into this fake extinction, they don't have much financial means compared to Anglo-American colonizers who now own these oil companies and all these other properties. Depending on who you ask, you're going to get different but kind of the same definitions. To me, land back means the returning of land to its original stewards, the indigenous peoples of whatever area that land is being returned to. It's simply about healing the land that has been continuously hurt by capitalism and the fossil fuel industry so that everybody can have a better life. As Karankwa Kadla, we knew about the work that Love had already been doing, uh, fighting Enbridge, well at the time Moda, oil export terminal, and it was wonderful. And her and I would talk about any way I could help, because I wanted to do something, because that site is just so important and I couldn't not, I just had to help. So we had a Zoom call. I remember she was saying that we needed to make like an action. And I was like, oh, like a protest? And she was like, yeah. So then we had another Zoom call, met a woman named Jessica, and her and I together organized the Austin Call to Action. It was so wonderfully successful. We had no idea that around 400 people would show up to show us their support and from there it's been a ripple. Um, different folks who were organized together in the first protest have stuck together to organize a corpus one and at the same time as the Austin one took place, which I believe was January 22nd, the Houston one also happened. Now there is a San Antonio call to action happening on July 23rd. I believe it's, there's just so much stuff, but yeah, that's the gist of it. It's just it's definitely expanded into a larger movement.
fighting for my ancestors' land, and now I'm here in so-called San Antonio organizing my own Line 3 protest. I am passionate about keeping oil giants out of our soil, and I am passionate about protecting Karankoa land, the land from, my, from which my ancestors came from long before the white man. Building this tar sand pipeline on sacred ground is an act of violence towards indigenous people, and I will not stand for that. I can't stand anyone. No more colonizers, no more pipelines. We are not gone, we are still here, and we are still fighting back. We will never back down. Currently, Enbridge is halting its construction of the seawall pipeline, which sounds like good news, but it isn't. Halting doesn't mean the pipeline is gone. It only means that it will be pushed back and pushed back until, until we lose interest. Then they will build the pipeline like a sneak attack. So don't give up, don't lose interest, and don't move on! So Enbridge, I am talking to you now, one on one. You will not see the last of us, and you will continue to see my face and hear my voice until you back down and stop hurting the Karanko Kala and its people. Love it. Hey, I'm the Bikia. I'm 18. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them, or just mix it. I'm Axel. I also go by Kwaraju. Um, I'm also 18. I use he, him. I'm also trying out uh, the pronoun ha e because it also means he or she or they in uh, my native language, Guarani. Yeah, this is your. This is gonna be your B-roll. It's just us dancing in the plane. Yeah, planes. Really, it was kind of just like a thought after the Corpus Christi protest. Um, I like attended that and I was just like, I kind of want to start one here because one wasn't started here in San Antonio and I don't think there was plans to or there was, but no one was really doing it. And I was just like, I'm ready to do this. I want to do this, but like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to like ask a bunch of people like, hey, do you have any resources on like what to do and like just anything really and it was and it kind of just like snowballed from there when you brought it up i was just i was like hell yeah i'll, I'll do that and if you need any help i'll definitely be there to help you and so that's kind of how i got involved um and yeah we've been working together since i sound, I sound so old <laughs> I was going to tell a little story about uh, when I was about eight, I remember yelling at some kids who were kicking this tree, telling them, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? And now Mother Earth has gotten to the point where all she can do is fight back. Because she's been through so much abuse, and because people didn't listen, and they continue to ignore it and be ignorant. And I, I'm just so confused as to how these people can't recognize that this planet is the only one of its kind. You know, um, I can't remember who I heard this from, but I remember hearing somebody say that this water is so sacred and we use it for every part of our life, death and everything in between. And this is the same water our ancestors drink. This wa water isn't just renewed, okay? It's, it goes through a cycle, but we are all tied to this water, to this land. Even if you're not from here, you should care because you are here. Thank you for listening. My reaction to just all of the mess that Enbridge is doing is I was fucking upset. I was really upset. Um, this answer is kind of like cringy, but I am very radical and I'm like an anarchist and a socialist. So I'm just like ready for the community to fight back. I'm ready for that like government to be overthrown. I'm ready for like the Supreme Court to like eat their shit and like like learn what's coming for them. Stand up! Fight back! Stand up! Fight back! Stand up! Fight back! Stand up! Fight back! I don't know which one to look at. Um, 
I go by Rio Witimea. That's my family name. It means arrow maker in Yaki or Yoeme. I'm a carpenter by trade. I run a community center here in San Antonio called Tortecali. Um, I'm a Mexica Danzante with the Calpulia Yolo Patsin here in San Antonio, Texas. And I've been involved in indigenous land reclamation projects and um, environmental movements since 2016, the Standing Rock Movement in North Dakota. And I'm just trying to bring the practices and wisdoms and um, the fire that was started there down to these lands in the south uh, with our people who struggle everywhere. But these are my homelands and, and I'm just trying to share that medicine. These fights against um, pipelines and, and things that, that poison or destroy the elements, uh, it's, it's not an indigenous people problem. It's a human being problem. It's a people problem. It's just that we're marginalized communities that are most directly affected by it. And we have for so long been in such connection to the elements that we feel a responsibility to tell people. So we're out here protesting, not because we want to be a threat to people, but we want to warn them and we want to plead them that, that we're desperate for, for their attention, um, for action, because inaction just means contributing to the, to the larger beast that is destroying things. You know, the, the sea levels are rising, there's droughts everywhere. Currently in Mexico, there's a drought where they can't even use water for more than three hours or something like that. So when, when is it gonna be in front of people's faces here in the United States or, or where is it, when is it gonna be so inevitable to confront? Is it gonna be too late at that point? myself as very spiritual. It's only been as of recently that I've been considered an activist. I like to consider myself a spiritual person more than I am an activist. And what that means to me is being able to very humbly and peacefully accept the wonderful honor and burden it is to be eternally connected with everything that the Creator has created, all of our relatives, the standing, swimming. I'm still kind of unlearning the fear that comes inside my heart whenever it comes with like sharing the spirituality. Because when we were growing up, I was taught and told that that was something that people thought was like a bad thing, or like people would think I was crazy, or we were crazy. So it's a huge journey with multiple facets of generational trauma, basically. I have an altar that has artifacts from the ground, from specifically the site that Enbridge is trying to destroy, and from different sites that my ancestors made with their jewelry, pottery, and on this altar, that's where I spend most of my time if I'm trying to reconnect with my ancestry through prayer and song and offerings. I unabashedly believe that everybody has a physical, emotional, mental connection to their ancestors and that it is so, so, so sad and intentional to be taught that you don't have a spirit, that you don't have that connection to your ancestry. So yeah, I believe you can talk to him, you can see him, you can feel him, whether that's in the dream world or in the physical world if you're that talented or if it's just a feeling you get, if it's the trees communicating with you in a separate way, it exists. This is a part of you. The elements are a part of you. The trees, the water, the, the, the wind, even like concerning air pollution, like all these things, they're attached to you. They're not separate or independent from you. So the sooner that people realize that, the sooner that they find their indigeneity. Because like I said, at Standing Rock, you find that indigenous people are from everywhere. It's just the inception of our connection to the earth. And at some point, along the line, even for brown people, even from people down here in the West who come from like an indigenous heritage, like those ties were severed. Those ties were severed with white people. Those ties were severed with Asian people. Those ties were severed with African descent people. It's the same for everyone. So it's about just reconnecting to that and relating to that indigeneity again. I feel like people don't understand that like genocide of a culture to strip somebody away of their language, like their indigenous language, to strip them away of their traditions. Like that in itself is a cultural genocide. And I feel like people see, oh, these people aren't directly getting killed or the people who are getting killed aren't being seen. Um, they just assume that it's not in the same level. I mean, like 
just seeing the fact that like my language is pretty much like almost completely wiped out like the Karankoa language um like I have a language book and I'm so grateful to my sister that uh she gave it to me it's just it's kind of just like words now there's very few sentences and there's like no way to learn it other than that book and it's just like so sad because our language used to be just so like vibrant there's always some genocide going on that people don't see when I talk about like cultural genocide it just really ties back to like how I grew up and like like personal experience because just I really kind of experienced the brunt of it we resist 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 thought that you'd be doing this or that you could pull something like this off.
Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I didn't think I could pull it off when I first started. I was just like, I'm worried this won't go anywhere, but I'll try. I didn't know what I could do and what I was capable of doing. But as soon as I started reconnecting, I kind of just got that like huge push. And then I'm, I'm like here now and it's crazy because now I have a community and it's just like something that I never had when I was a kid or something that I never experienced. And it was like so nice to finally like experience that. Um, a year ago, I, I probably wouldn't have thought that I'd be here doing this or have had done the protest, but I'm very proud of myself and uh, everybody that I've met. And I think that um, connections have been made that I, I don't think I'll ever like regret. And I feel uh, stronger in my community now. It's really calming to know uh, that all of our hard work and our thousands of years of just trying to defend the Gulf is paying off, no matter how big or how small. It's, it's wonderful to see. It gives me a sense of peace and hope. What we're doing here in our bay, I think I don't see it as significant. I, have, I, I feel like I'm just doing something that's natural. I have people saying, oh, it's amazing what y'all are doing. And, and I don't, I just feel like it's something that we are meant to do and it's causing momentum and, and power and that's beautiful so yeah when i think of love sanchez i think of like an undeniable presence and force in your face water protector land defender when i had first met her in person i remember one of the things she told me was that not a lot of like those uh like men in power down in corpus like her and I could see why, because she gets like right up in their face and she tells them how it is so powerful. She's a powerful woman. I'm Blood Sanchez. I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. I'm a part of the Karanguacala tribe. And I'm also a co-founding member of the indigenous peoples of the Coastal Bend. I wanted to update y'all on the federal lawsuit that we have filed against Enbridge. As of right now, we have halted the construction on Karanguacala land three times. <laughs> The last um, injunction that was filed has pushed back the construction all the way to October 25th, 2021. Uh -huh. So from San Antonio, we're gonna go and we're gonna go to Houston, and then we're gonna circle back to Corpus and give them hell. <laughs>
your descendants, and not, not even your direct descendants, but just the generations that come after you, seven generations after you. What is the world going to be like for them? What is their culture going to be? What is their mindset going to be? What is their internal uh, uh, harmony going to be like? Are, are they going to love themselves? Are they going to hate themselves? Are they even going to survive? Our lives are so consumed with just going from paycheck to paycheck, are trying to take care of our families, are feeling like the pressure of financial instability that's been placed on us right now. And it's really hard to think outside of your situation and circumstances when you're having to focus so desperately on just surviving in this country. So it's not my place in these types of situations to tell people what I think they should think about because life is so hard right now. It's weird and it's uncomfortable, but the only reason why we have to do this is because change has never happened when folks was comfortable. And so I would ask folks to just simply start asking themselves very important questions like, I get to drink clean water, does everybody else? Because of, no. Or I get to go visit my parents at the cemetery, does everybody else? No. In Lakesh. In Lakesh, I am you. You are me. You are my other me. That's it. I would want to tell people to never give up. And even as hopeless as it might feel, when we see so much industry just like coming into this area, that we do have the power. We have the power to express what our needs are and to tell the people that presume to be in power that we don't actually agree or want what they're trying to offer us. And to simply say, to just stand up and say, I don't agree and I don't want this. You'll find your community of people that feel the same as you and you won't feel so alone. So just never give up looking for your community, never give up fighting for your community and for your family and for yourself. People need to know that their voice matters. Yeah, and if it didn't, they wouldn't try to stop us. I always say uh, start asking questions, get your historic facts from the actual people that it affected, that were impacted by it, and then I always add, reconnect to your own ancestors, reroute yourself into the land, you'll find such peace that way. For the direct support, um, capitalism, money goes a long way, uh, support protest organizers and other indigenous communities monetarily. If you don't have the money, you can share our posts, share our efforts, share articles. If you don't have social media and you somehow just saw us on the street, you don't have anywhere else to help, just tell other people what is happening, anything. What would you say to people who feel like they can't make a difference, so there's nothing I feel like that's exactly what our government would hope for people to believe, that they have no power. But that's why we're in the position that we are, because we have forgotten that we are the power, that our civic engagement is necessary, that even just going to a permit process meeting where you say, I don't agree with this and I don't want this in my community, is taking action, is showing them that you know enough to stand up for yourself and for your family and for your community and for the planet. What is something you hope that you are remembered for? <laughs> oh man, I was gonna put in my obituary when I did a donut at Co-Park. <laughs> I want to be remembered for the donut I did at Co-Park. No. <laughs> Don't tell do nobody. <laughs> so I pass away. Keep that. Keep that. <laughs> I'm gonna have a video. Um, for, I want to be remembered for, I feel like a kid, <laughs> I want to be remembered for, five, like 10 years ago I wrote in a, in a journal and I put, I want to be famous for something that I did good in the world. But to be honest, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I was like, oh, and I was like, okay, I guess that, you know, it was too broad what I wanted to manifest. And it just like, the universe was like, okay. <laughs> um, so I guess this is, I'm where I'm at. Like, and I feel good. I, I'm going to be, we're going to be remembered for what we did. So yeah.